Hi and welcome. Um, just for the sake of descriptions, I am a middle-aged Caucasian woman with brown hair sitting in front of a very full bookshelf with some art. Hi and welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for doing this. Hi, I'm Rachel Unger. I am a uh, white, queer, disabled person who's wearing a red shirt and a weed grandpa vest. It's a great grandpa vest. I love that. Yes. Are you embracing your grandpa? I really, I am trying to lean into my grandpa era. Nice. Yes. That's good. Uh, give yourself some nice cozy places to hang out. and. So oh, I got a, a little tweed cap to match too. Thank you again for being part of this. This is the third time that you've been part of Opulent, the second time. Yeah. It's great. I'm so glad you were able to. It sounds like you've just been doing quite a lot with your artwork lately in the past few years. Earlier this year, I had a solo art show at Wicked Ground, which it was and is now slightly different, but was a oh. San Francisco kink, queer, sex positive, safe space that hosts events and also is a cafe and was a kind of community yeah. gathering location. Now they've transitioned just to be more of an organization rather than a physical space. But at the time, mm. my art was covering the walls in rainbows, which was lovely. That's awesome. Uh, I know you were also in the Art of Disability Culture, uh, oh, yeah. the, the Fran Osborne show, which was great. It was an amazing show. I uh, At the Palo Alto Art Center, I was part of that version of the show, and I had a whole nook of my art opposite uh, this very cool disabled fashion designer's work, two-story print of Anthony Tussler's self-portrait of himself in a wheelchair when he was a young man looking very manly. That was the beginning of my really pursuing disability and queerness and sexuality as kind of a connected concept. Nice. In that show. And I was really exploring showing disabled people as we are, as people perceive us to be. And then I was able to be in um, the Art of Disability Culture, the Fran Osborne version of that show, also showed in San Francisco at Ruth's Table. Yeah. So my art traveled, literally without me, um, to San Francisco, and we did that show there too. So that was that was a lot of fun. It's really wonderful, very joy-filled work. I really love that about it. I It's interesting because people don't really think of me as an optimist and I don't really think of me as an optimist. I like to take like the good and the bad, and say all right then to both of them and have them in life. Um, but I think that there are parts of the disabled queer community that most people don't see. Mm -hmm. They don't see us caring for each other. They don't see our interdependence and they don't really see like how sexy we get to be and so I wanted to share that because when people don't see us as we are it's very easy for everyday discrimination to become the systemic discrimination that we currently have and yeah my way of fighting back against that is to confront these derogatory stereotypes themselves Mm -hmm. and see if I can adjust people's perspective about our community. Beautiful. I'm going to share your piece, speaking about joyous. Yeah, this this is a particularly joyous piece, actually. So can you tell us about Disabled Drag as Joy? Um, well, this is being, I painted this as all of these anti-drag, anti-trans bills are written into law. There's been more than 500 of these laws proposed and many of them are actively harming our community. I got to finally go to a drag show. I don't get to go very often because they always happen late at night and I'm disabled and tired late at night. But this one happened during the daytime. Oaklash um, happened in Oakland's downtown Old Town area. Mm -hmm. The drag performer, Jenip Star, they were just dancing with such vibrancy and flipping their hair around and so much enthusiasm and joy and the crowd was going wild and so I, I took a video of their work and their performance and I haven't been inspired to paint since I got in a car accident in February because it's Ugh. just physically challenging 
And this was the first painting that I was really excited to sit down and paint and that I was able to finish since that car accident. And I just feel so grateful that their performance, like to experience their performance and that I could then make art sort of inspiration from yeah. their performance that that made me really happy. Oh, it's just wonderful. And you can feel it, mm -hmm. I think, in there. It just seems like a joy of release. Yeah. And and this like playfulness in drag, this mm -hmm. ability to be able to play with gender and play with who you are and and play with the crowd. Yeah. It's so much fun. And I take my little cousin to the drag show and she is she has a blast. So awesome. When did you start painting in this particular style? My paintings have kind of gotten less realistic in color over time, which mm -hmm. I've just been using color for fun, really. What better way? Right. <laughs> when I was in college at UCLA, I painted in sort of an expressionist adjacent style and I painted really quickly. I kind of came down with my disability at the end of senior year and then the summer mm. after it got really, really bad. Mm. And I wasn't really able to paint for many, many years. Um, but when I be started to train myself how to paint again, I leaned into that expressionist style because mm. it means that you don't have to have smooth brush strokes and you don't have to have nice perfect line and that the the jitteriness of your brush stroke because I have hands that shake and my disability is in my hands so painting's really painful so if you mm. have kind of chaotic energized brush strokes that adds to the style and I paint in really quick spurts and then I'll take like a two-hour break and then I'll paint in a quick spurt again um, so I may not finish the painting quickly, but I paint exceptionally quickly in order to make these. And, uh, yeah, just a little bit every time I paint, kind of trying to work out the best method and what I want to explore. Finding new ways each time. Um, are you finding that like there's different styles of painting that work more easily for you? I find that I like to use acrylics because they dry so quickly. Got it. That oils make these beautiful, smooth shapes. People love them for skin and creaminess. But I actually, I like to have the individual strokes that acrylics gives us and the, that layering of the strokes themselves. I was yeah. going to show um, some of the pieces from last year's show, oh, that if would you be don't mind. Yeah. Because that's, because I think that really shows those brush strokes. Not that the other one doesn't as well, but you can really see that. Yeah, the, the painting, um, purple painting is called Here for All of You and the yellow one is called My Power, My Love. And these paintings are um, much larger than the one that I submitted to your show this year. And I think that a painting that's about the size of my torso, more or less, is a really good size for me physically to manipulate because then mm. I can have those like, when I try to make these details in the face that you see on the purple painting, the characters kept getting larger and larger and larger. And so I had to have a big enough painting to catch the details of the face because I don't have the same fine motor skills as I used to have. And so having that slightly larger piece is physically much easier. Um, but I, I love the vibrancy of these two paintings. Absolutely. And there's and there's just so much movement and joy in them. Yeah, and I love um, in my power, my love the these three simple, well, four colors of black, red, yellow, and whitish yellow, mm -hmm. and how that conveys the whole message. I love that you see the person in the wheelchair pulling their partner close, and I love that that consensual kink power dynamic which kind of flips power dynamic on its head of what you might assume would be happening in a disabled relationship. But this person's the one in charge here. Pretty clear. Yeah. And the other person's loving it. So, you know, everybody wins. I can see where you, that expressionist kind of style. Were you always more uh, drawn to painting people? Yeah, actually, I I have tried 
to get excited about landscapes or still mm -hmm. lifes and all these things and even abstract art. And I really admire people who can do that because there's something about like the repetitiveness of large amounts of trees or buildings or whatever I don't get excited about when I'm making it. When I see someone else has made it, great. But I love the way that people are kind of their own world, but we're all also sharing this common humanity while living our own reality. I like that juxtaposition. It really is wonderful. Do you like create characters for the people? Do you like give them names? I am a shameless people watcher. And <laughs> the, the part that I like about painting people is that I kind of, I like sharing an emotion more than individual humans' faces. So for some paintings, I will literally combine five different images of different people in my head mm. and then turn them into a single person in the painting. And I'll just grab features from each until the painting is happy. And this this most recent one, Disabled Drag is Joy, is actually one of the few paintings I made in a long time that was based on an individual. And I wasn't trying to be 100% truthful to their this their whole like visual experience because they've got that down and that is beautiful mm -hmm. uh, but I did want to share how I felt when I was watching their performance and and like how much good that gave me yeah oh how much fun is that it was a good show nice yeah there's actually a, a good amount of disabled drag performers in the bay area who are using their space advocate for the disabled community which is really cool that's really wonderful so what got you into doing opulent mobility what made you decide to sign up for that i had met at anthony tussler in the the art of disability culture and he that makes total he, sense <laughs> yeah he let me know that this show existed he was like ah. this is an <laughs> show. you should check it out and well, I, I've been kind of under a rock because of being disabled and not getting out much. So even when popular mm. mobility has been around for more than a decade, and I was just so well, excited. Just, just a decade, but still, it's like. It's still going, though. So yeah. like, in the future, it will be more than close enough. Of course, it you will know, be. Like The fact that a group of people would be excited enough to talk about dis disability and to talk about to talk about it in. A, an honest but uplifting light like not we're not trying to sugarcoat anything but to, no. to show a different side of the narrative yeah I think that it's just not something that we see enough of yeah look any marginalized group it's really easy to focus on the things that are hard and it, it's not at all that that's not appropriate I'm saying that there are other aspects to everybody's lives even with the things about disability that's hard there's so little representation of yeah. any kind so I've never seen anyone like me on television that's that's not a thing I've seen animated characters that remind myself of me but so to see to see a show like opulent mobility take on that challenge for many different years and to evolve and grow is very cool yeah I liked how there was this discussion around sort of the disability access needs and your wheelchair, your walker, just kind of being this unpretty medical device where it could be this fabulous form of self-expression. And I, I mean, there are people turning their canes into studs, like sharp pointy metal studs. And I think that's really beautiful. This part of disability just being part of life and being inevitable if you live long enough and not being this this thing that we could be afraid of and avoid like even if it's hard disability is part of life and so what what can we do with that and I that's what I like about I mean that's what got me really excited about opulent mobility is kind of seeing claiming disability as part of identity and and something that even when it's hard, you don't have to be afraid of. You can suffer, like suffering is part of life. But then what do you do? What happens next? And like, what do you, what kind of life do we have? And sometimes it can be really beautiful. For some people, the, the assumption is that disability is tragedy. 
-hmm. And that's the only, it, that's a very one note. And let's, let's be honest. I mean, whose life is purely comedy? <laughs> whose life is purely joy? Uh, it doesn't matter at all that we all we all have a lot of different aspects to our lives disability has its own it needs to be shown because otherwise you're you're not really viewing people as human fully and yeah. that is the thing that really bothers me that's like, that's the <clears throat> thing is I mean, my art when you look at it looks very joyous and celebratory but it's actually coming from this place of of pain and anger because I have gone into doctor's offices and I, as a disabled woman perceived creature, am treated quantifiably worse than a man and an able bodied person. And let's not even get started on how people tweet, treat queer people. So I remember like going to the doctors and asking, hey, can I have a continuation of this medicine? And the doctor saying, no, that's not possible. And then when a man asked the same question on my behalf, same words. The answer is yes, and here's your prescription. Oops. And that's a huge difference in care that yeah. the doctors are unaware of because it's implicit bias. Um, and then the other thing that would happen is the doctor would say, they can't help me. There's nothing they can do. And honestly, sometimes that's true. And it's a really hard pill that I have to swallow for almost all of my doctor's appointments, if we're honest. Yeah, uh. it's, it's challenging. So I say thank you very much for your time and put on my jacket and respectfully try to leave. And the doctor chastises me as you would a small child trying to leave class early. And that is how I am treated. Well, apparently I was supposed to be a good little girl and wait my turn. This is the background. And maybe one day I'll know how to paint that. But it's so complicated to try to paint systemic discrimination. I mean, because the really bad stuff... Is the, the worst stuff is that there are whole departments of medical facilities that I'm not allowed to see because I'm a chronic pain patient. Whereas if I was able-bodied, they don't have that policy. That's hmm. discrimination. Yeah. It just is. It's very clear, but when you tell the doctor that's discrimination, they don't understand. They think discrimination is one person being mean to another. Whereas what I'm talking about is a system that is built to harm one group and help another at this group's expense yeah and i tried to paint about the hard stuff but it was too palatable in its own way actually interesting like, i painted a um i mean an image about someone having to take a seat on the floor of the bus rather than in any chair mm -hmm. because no one would give this disabled person a chair because they looked able-bodied like not mm -hmm. all not all disabilities are visible mine is not it's not, I don't use mobility aids, so people don't notice. And the thing about that is you can always say to yourself when you look at a painting like that, oh, I wouldn't be the person that would ignore this person. I would do better. And maybe you would, it's possible. But the thing that no individual is going to be able to rise above is a system that is built to harm a whole group of people. And that yeah. was missing when people looked at that painting. They would see a moment, but the system that that they might be benefiting from, that they're a part of, that's what they I couldn't figure out how to paint. And so that is tricky. Yeah. And maybe somebody somebody has it and we should all look at their art because that would be great. Right. But I so instead I was like, OK, what is causing this? What what feeling what misinformation is causing this? And the big one is not treating disabled people like adults. At best, yeah. we were treated like children at any age, regardless of mental capacity. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the assumption that disabled people are going to be a burden. And the other part is the assumption that disabled people don't have any sexuality at all, which I'm sure that exists for some people, but it's a very large community. We're very diverse in our desires and needs. So I kind of try to show the other side of that to challenge people's preconceptions. And that way they do have to, on some even subconscious level, confront this is different from how I thought things were. It's a theme in the disabled community that we care for each other, that it's not just one person providing for the other. And I think that that creativity in compassion is something that not everyone has experience with. And they have experience with people needing them, but not 
give and take. And I, I, I think that maybe as a culture, we've sort of forgotten how to care for each other as a community. If I want to be in someone's life, I want to know when things are hard because otherwise I feel like I'm getting the facade that you share with everyone else rather than who you actually are. That's the kind of relationships I want to build. Those are the best kind. 